At the end of 2010, Spotify was getting ready to launch in the U.S. when its co-founder and CEO, Daniel Ek, was receiving odd phone calls during the middle of the night. Daniel told a colleague, He called me, and he was just breathing in the phone. Then, without having a word, he hung up. Do you know who it is? The colleague asked. Yes, it's Steve Jobs. Before we get into the story of how Spotify contributed to the evolution of the music industry, I want to welcome you to Business Successful, where it's all about successful founders and businesses. Pre-Spotify Before the internet, selling music was a very profitable business. Record labels were enjoying profit margins of 85-95% to 95% on every CD sold, royalties excluded, and they had never really been challenged on these margins. That was until 1999, when the record labels and record stores were cut out of the deal because people started sharing their music to each other via the internet, a process called piracy. The biggest service for piracy was Napster. First introduced in 1999, they allowed people to share their music via files with each other. As you can imagine, the record labels fought hard to shut Napster down. They succeeded at this, winning the legal battle in 2000, and Napster was forced to shut down on July 11, 2001. The record labels hoped that the court ruling in 2000 would be enough to stop the piracy but knew that it was unlikely. And when the well-known visionary Steve Jobs saw this, he recognized an opportunity for Apple. Jobs offered to help the record labels fight piracy by offering their music on an app that would be pre-installed on all iPods, iTunes. And the business model of iTunes would be the same as before, meaning people had to buy a song for 99 cents and an album for $9.99 before they could listen to something. The record labels liked it and agreed. On the 9th of January, 2001, iTunes launched with Steve Jobs announcing the service as a legal alternative to piracy. The start of Spotify. One person fascinated by Napster was a young genius called Daniel Ek. Growing up in a working class family in Sweden, Daniel's two loves were music and technology. He became a young entrepreneur when, at the age of 13, he created a website for a local store owner. He charged only $100 for it. Then his price increased to $200, and eventually, he was charging his clients $5,000 per website. And at the age of 18, Daniel was earning about $50,000 per month building websites. After only a couple weeks of college, Daniel dropped out and founded Advertigo, an online marketing company which he sold to Trade Doubler for $1.25 million at the age of 23. After selling his company, Daniel became close friends with Martin Lorenzen, who is 13 years his senior and the co-founder of the company that had just bought Daniel's company. Daniel soon told Martin about this idea he had, a software that would allow users to listen to all the music they could possibly imagine, and instead of having to buy it, they could either listen to it free of charge with an ad-supported version, or they could simply pay a small monthly subscription fee to remove the ads. Upon hearing this idea, Martin got excited and offered to start the company together on a 50-50 basis, with Martin as the main financier, investing $10 million into it, a number which would be significantly higher later on, and Daniel as the guy running the company. Daniel accepted the offer, and so they founded Spotify on April 23, 2006. The First Years of Spotify Before Spotify would launch, they would need to build the software, and Spotify would have to get the rights for the music from at least three of the four major record labels. Daniel, together with a small team of engineers, wanted to make sure that a prototype of the software would be ready before pitching the idea to record labels. Daniel told Martin the labels would be willing and the process shouldn't take too long. He thought they would welcome Spotify with open arms, since the music industry had had declining revenue every year since 1999, and executives at several record labels had already told Daniel that they thought the idea was promising and he should come in for his pitch. It didn't go as smooth as expected, however, with the main issue for the labels being the freemium model where you can either use a product in a premium version or free of charge in a slightly worse version. This model was highly uncommon at the time and would demand a major shift for the labels who were used to doing things the old way and not changing too much. Finally, in 2008, the labels did give in, 
and Spotify was given the licensing to the catalog of all major labels. Spotify would launch October of the same year. To get the licensing, Daniel and Martin had to negotiate for about two years. And besides them paying a large sum of money to the record labels, they also had to sell 20% of their stocks to the big four record labels for just $112,000. Spotify's launch in Sweden was a huge success, and it allowed them to slowly spread out to other European countries before they would eventually launch in the United States in July of 2011. Every time Spotify launched in a new country, they restricted signups to invite only. The reasoning behind this was not only to make sure the servers weren't overloaded, they also realized the power of creating hype and exclusivity. Spotify versus Apple. Remember Steve Jobs' prank call to Daniel Eck? Well, it's not sure whether the story is true or not, because no one can prove if it was Steve Jobs. However, it's no secret that Steve Jobs didn't like Spotify. He saw iTunes as a major asset for Apple and told his friends in the music industry that he did not understand why one would give away his or her music for free. But it wasn't until Spotify wanted to expand to the United States that the relationship between Apple and Spotify really soured. At first, the app was denied because it supposedly didn't comply with Apple's guidelines for apps. And when the app was finally allowed on the App Store, Spotify got mad that 30% of revenue made through the App Store would need to be paid to Apple. This rule applies to everyone, but to Daniel, this is ridiculous. Because Apple, a competitor of theirs, obviously doesn't need to pay this fee, so it creates an unfair competition. In May of 2014, Apple acquired Beats for a new company record of $3 billion. While Beats was known for their headphones, the main reason Apple bought them for a record number wasn't this. It was because they wanted their own streaming service with a subscription model, and that's precisely something Beats had already created. Apple quickly rebranded the service to Apple Music. Daniel Eck was clearly not happy with the news and immediately sent out a tweet with the words, Oh, okay, which he would later delete. In July of 2015, a year after Apple's acquisition, Spotify was done preparing for a war and opened their attack on Apple by sending an email to their subscribers, asking them to cancel their current subscription in the App Store and instead subscribe via Spotify's own website. This would allow for Spotify to bypass the 30% transaction fee Apple charges, which would save users $3 every month. Shortly after sending this email, Spotify sent a letter to the Antitrust Committee of Europe where they accused Apple of abusing their position at the top of the market and saying that Apple has transformed into the gatekeeper instead of the gateway. The committee said they would look into the complaint, but eventually, nothing happened. This hasn't stopped Spotify from fighting, however, and just last year, they joined Epic Games, the company behind Fortnite, in founding the Coalition for App Fairness. The goal of the coalition is to fight for better terms for all companies who own apps in the App Store. Spotify and Facebook Ever since Napster was forced to shut down, co-founder Sean Parker had dreamed of building something similar to Spotify. As he wrote in an email he sent to Daniel Eck, I might have tried had I not been sidetracked with Plaxo, Facebook, Founders Fund, etc. To be fair, I had very little desire to work with the record labels too soon after my somewhat unpleasant experience with them the first time around. So rather than dive in again, I adopted a watch-and-wait philosophy, hoping that the labels would either, one, come to their senses and try something new, two, forced to the brink of extinction, hire new management opening the door to radical new ideas. Sean Parker was such a fan of Spotify that he even showed the software to his friend Mark Zuckerberg, who loved it as well, and immediately updated his Facebook status to, Spotify is so good. This was in 2009 two years before Spotify would actually come to the United States. So the status update created an even bigger hype for Spotify to come to the US. When they finally did in 2011, they partnered with Facebook to promote the software to all Facebook users. This partnership wasn't Mark doing Daniel a favor, however. Zuckerberg wanted to make the streaming of music a social thing and demanded that every Spotify user must be logged in with a Facebook account 
and he wanted everyone to be able to see what their Facebook friends were streaming. Spotify gave in to Facebook's demands, even though it was obvious that this demand would not resonate well with most of its users. The features were already taken away in Germany after a couple of months, however, where people were very skeptical of Facebook's intentions. And soon after, the features were taken away everywhere. The partnership between Facebook and Spotify is one of the key reasons why Spotify became the world's leader for streaming music, and today, Facebook is still key to Spotify's growth. Think of this. How many times have you seen your friends share their end of the year wrapped on Instagram or Facebook? You probably answered, a lot of times. Now think about the value of that free advertising for Spotify. Fair pay. We can't talk about how Spotify changed the music industry without discussing how they changed the way artists are paid. Around 70% of Spotify's revenue is paid to rights holders. Given that those rights holders are generally record labels, who then distribute the money according to their agreements with the artists. Spotify can't really say how much an artist makes. However, they have publicly stated that the average per play payout is between $0.006 and $0.0084. This low payout has led to a lot of controversy, and in 2014, Taylor Swift had seen enough and decided to shake off Spotify by taking all her music off the streaming service. A year later, in 2015, Adele boycotted both Apple Music and Spotify by not releasing her new album, 25, on the streaming services until seven months after the album was released. The boycotts have not led to a raise in pay, and in June of 2017, Taylor Swift put her music back on Spotify. Competition In the beginning of 2015, Jay-Z offered Spotify a unique deal. He would endorse them and keep all his music on the platform if Spotify agreed to pay him $1 billion. Spotify refused this offer, so Jay-Z took his music off the software and bought two Swedish services, Tidal and Wimp. Not long after the acquisitions, he announced his new streaming home, Tidal. Title would become an online streaming service owned by 16 well-known artists, including Beyonce, Madonna, and Rihanna. Jay-Z told Billboard, People are not respecting the music and devaluing what it really means. People really feel like music is free, but will pay $6 for water. You can drink water free out of the tap, and it's good water. But they're okay paying for it. It's just the mindset right now. The competition between the three... Apple Music, Spotify, and Tidal was fierce, and the term album windowing became a thing. This is a release strategy where new albums would only be available on one platform before it would be available on the other platforms. Spotify wasn't a fan of this release strategy, and their global head of communications, Jonathan Prince, explained in an interview with The Verge why, saying, Artists want as many fans as possible to hear their music and fans want to be able to hear whatever they're excited about or interested in. Exclusives get in the way of that for both sides. Of course, we understand that short promotional exclusives are common, and we don't have an absolute policy against them. But we definitely think the best practice for everybody is wide release. In 2017, Spotify proved that they don't have an absolute policy against it by announcing that, from that point onwards, artists can release an album to premium users only for two weeks, before non-paying users have access to the new album. The move was well received by the record labels, who had pushed hard for this in their new licensing contracts with Spotify. Today, Apple Music has more users in the US than Spotify, but globally, it's clear that Spotify is still right where it started, in the lead. Spotify has 138 million users, a number significantly higher than Apple's 72 million, and Tidal although it's unclear how many users they have today, because they have not released this data since 2016, when they had 3 million users. Thank you for watching our video on Spotify. Let us know your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more.